video is so today's video today's video today's video so today's video so today's video there we go does that sound better to you so today's video is talking about rp um i sound okay do i <gasps> that fucking phone if i drop it again leave it there it can stay there now welcome back to seek Strength youtube so a lot of times when people contact us and they ask about our program, so obviously they haven't seen our program, first they'll ask a question, you know, is it RP or is it percentage based or what's the story, you know? And obviously we, we've mentioned a few times in, in smaller areas, but we've never made a video about why we don't use RP for strength training. This morning we saw a video from Jeff Nippard, which we are fairly, we like him in, in general, like we like some stuff he puts out, it's fairly level-headed. Uh, he's good reasoning behind most of his things um, that are not not the dumbest reasons which that are seen. not to do with rp so for yeah so, so like some of the reasons he puts out compared to other youtubers when they put out stuff like this or other coaches you know at least he has legitimate reasons behind what he does and that's as good a reason as any so we thought we'd make this video about why we don't use rpe for strength training so uh jeff released a video uh mr nippard nip nippard nippard Je jeff nippard uh released a video coming at a rebuttal from that 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 the guy at Linux who I'm not even going to watch. We not, we didn't watch the video. We refused to watch any of his stuff. But so Jeff made a rebuttal. Guys, so in this video, I want to share some of my recent thoughts about RPE and address five of the most common criticisms I've been hearing lately. Based on the principles of RPE for hypertrophy training, you know, bodybuilding, etc. So that's obviously not where we're coming from. But we just want to talk a little bit about why some of these reasons that Jeff uses for bodybuilding training and why they might be useful for that, they don't necessarily transfer over into practical solutions for strength training. Yeah, exactly. So RP, um, for those of you who are kind of, you might have just heard about this in the last few days or you might have been using it for a while, but RP is rate of perceived exertion. Uh, RP scales, there's loads of different RP scales out there, right? The ones you commonly see are a one to 10 scale uh, and it will be, for lifting weights, they usually use reps in reserve of your as your thing of like perceived exertion, right? So um, an RPE of 10 on most of the standard scales would mean you've no reps in reserve. You couldn't have done any more. You have absolutely exhausted that set for the maximum amount of reps you can do. Where RPE was commonly used and where its kind of genesis came from was when looking at intensity levels of aerobic exercise. So this would be rate of perceived exertion. You'd have a scale, maybe 1 to 16, maybe 1 to 10, maybe 4 to 16. These scales aren't just a 1 to 10 scale, and they're not just to do with reps um, on like whatever the resistance training exercise is. Commonly, and where the most kind of accurate data came from was, you'd ask people their rate of perceived exertion during a running or an aerobic exercise bout, and you'd have a blood pressure monitor or you'd have a heart rate monitor on them. And those increases in heart rate would be shown to be increasing uh, incrementally with RPE. And just, just then, like, a really fine point on that. So pacing yourself in aerobic events, so running, for example, is very, very hard. Even for the most experienced runners, it's it's an incredibly delicate thing. You, It's such a long event that it's so hard. So if you take like Kipchoge's um, two unofficial to our marathon, sub to our marathon, he had... A laser tracker he had a car moving in front of him he has decades of experience in running the pace car is gone we've lost the laser he's it's getting now one it's now. and he had multiple different pacers with him and yeah. he still had to fine-tune his pacing so it was developed for aerobic capacity in terms of it's just so hard to pace yourself no matter how much you have going with you but in strength training we have the most absolute and objective measures of of performance of what you're doing of how tough something is it's the weight on the bar relative percentage of your one rm it's a uh, kilogram doesn't change anywhere on earth so that's ultimately what we have so we uh, technically it changes at different altitudes because it's a measurement of mass very and minorly weight. don't like unless that like hudson bay in canada where you've less gravity there or whatever <laughs> but in terms of you know we know what a kilogram always is we know what 100 kilos is in in terms of your ability your max ability and your least ability so you're not to 10 we know what 100 kilograms is there depending on what your max is so like the first thing you talk about is is beginners okay so the first criticism of rpe is that it's fine for intermediate and advanced trainees but isn't all that good for beginners um 
and beginners are something that comes up in the literature a lot about RP and beginners maybe not being able to gauge RP correctly. Beginners can't gauge a lot of things correctly, right? Uh, if it's for the strength training movements, they're in a phase of skill acquisition or more than likely they're in a phase of skill acquisition, particularly if it's for the bigger lifts, like it's for back squat, deadlift, bench press, snatch, clean and jerk. They're learning so much and they're in a stage of such neurological development and adaptation that they don't understand. Like they're they're definitely not going to understand their rate of perceived exertion, right? And they're in this case, like the example of bodybuilding is absolutely perfect because in bodybuilding, you should never like, especially for beginners, they should never be going close to failure. The problem when we transfer that over to strength training and particularly kind of competitive strength training where it's really outcome measurements we're looking at is that this level of intensity is constantly changing and particularly in beginners it is constantly changing so if I take a youth athlete who's 17 years old they've started weightlifting and they're snatching 70 kilos at the moment that 70 kilos could move from 70 kilos to 85 kilos within the state this the period of two and a half weeks or two and a half months or a year so you don't, the relative intensity is is constantly changing so, so quickly because the skill acquisition is the main rate limiting factor there. You can't really use RPE as a, a gauge because if we give a technical cue on a snatch, the snatch suddenly changes and the, the perceived exertion during the lift has changed drastically. So an example I would give in this is, we often see people during their first pull on a snatch having their knees too far forward. And this isn't just for weightlifting, but the example is their knees are too far forward and they kind of squat the weight upwards. If we then get them to push their knees back as they pull the barbell off the floor and the bar travels straight up and their knees get out of the way of the bar, that pull will be so much heavier. Like they will, everybody will say it. You'll always, you'll be expecting the feedback of being, oh, that pull felt so much heavier. But the lift itself is so much better and they have so much more potential to generate force and to have a, a higher top end figure. So I think it is important to note like this is where the difference is of that in strength training and skill acquisition of those like particular discrete movements. The things that alter how the weight feels isn't just physiological adaptation. A lot of the time it's skill acquisition, it's neurological adaptation, it's how they feel on the day and it's not just the muscular capacity to contract. So like the next thing that's mentioned then is the, the kind of test for RP or learning how to use RP. If you're doing an exercise that you can fail safely on, let's say an incline dumbbell press, once you get to a point where you think you could do two more reps, call it out, say out loud, okay, I'm at an RP eight now, and then actually push it to failure. And this is where it's another stage where it doesn't really work for strength training, but in particular, it doesn't work for beginner athletes. So the case here is you're doing a set of 10. You have no idea how many reps you're doing. And when you feel like you're on your second last rep, you're going to call it. I have two more reps and you'll go to RP 10, right? So you call it on rep 18 of a 20 set or 20 rep set. Realistically, everybody has a number in their mind coming into this set. Because I know if I pick up a pair of 20 kilo dumbbells and I'm doing incline press like he's doing in this video, I know full well how many reps I'm going to do for 20, right? Everybody with more than 10 days of training experience will have a number in their head when they pick up a certain weight of dumbbell. So unless the weight is unknown and I'm just going purely on feeling, then this is slightly disingenuous. I think people's are not disingenuous, but I, ju I just don't think it's really applicable in a real world scenario with anyone who has more than four sessions under their belt with this particular exercise yeah like wh where it's so uneasy that you could just tell yourself you're going to do more reps out loud then we'd all be doing that yeah like yeah exactly people are so malleable in terms of their psychology and yeah like hypertrophy training isn't what i'm technically trained in but sport and exercise psychology is what i'm technically changed in or trained in and this level of as if you're going to train yourself to say okay uh yeah, I feel like I have two more reps. The vast majority of the population could have three more reps or four more reps. But realistically, because you've cued yourself and you've kind of primed that neurological pathway to be like, oh, the second rep feels so heavy. You're giving yourself a small bit of that 
positive feedback in in the case whereby you're saying geez I, i'm really good at rp i was bang on there yeah you know like yeah. the last thing you're going to do is like oh i feel like i have two more reps nobody's that more nobody's that honest but they feel like they have two more reps and you have five or six more reps left so jeff's kind of second and third point there in this video are so it's people are using kind of rp to not train hard enough essentially is what point two and three boils down to so point three is kind of um it, it's for pussies basically what he said so i saw mark mark Ripito's video recently on that um it, where he's basically said it's for pussies you know and people have used this criticism before to say that people don't use rp to not train hard enough and to be honest we're kind of in agreement that for first strength training so there's a di the difference between training hard and training sensibly are kind of you know two different things but when we look at from our you know a lot we've seen a lot of people training you know especially in absolute strength training you know squat bench and deadlift a lot of times people will just be consistently too heavy so jeff recommends here that somewhere around rp7 seems like the appropriate place to be when you're training for hypertrophy training the problem with that right for if you transfer that over to strength training is that you need to be constantly moving through different phases of training and push yourselves you know a concept of overload so you're pushing through each one of these right but what we see often is people continuous continuously in a, a stage of kind of acquir acquiring fatigue almost but not actually pushing in either direction so they're not pushing up their volume or decreasing their volume and they're not increasing their tensity or too low so what very often is we see people when they're strength training is that they're at this somewhere around rp7 for example or even a little bit higher so they're very close to their max consistently all throughout the year but they're never really pushing the volume which is a key driver of strength training so for strength training you obviously you have to be near heavy weights that's absolutely without doubt but you also need to facilitate these heavy weights through put different phases of volume so you need to be at certain levels of volume to acquire the strength so that's why we mentioned if you watch a video like why you can't squat heavy every day because you can't squat enough volume with relevant intensities to push yourself into new areas of growth essentially so if you were to use rp as a measure of how you periodize your programming so you go uh this week rp1 or next week rp4 um with your sets and reps and then you go next week rp whatever seven eight and then you know you fluctuate these or whatever the problem with this is is that you have to be moving in the realms close to your maxes and very often what we would see with people doing at rp is essentially they're floundering in the water as such and using consistently similar weights that are somewhat difficult you know the subjectivity of people six and seven and a half feel very very similar realistically for most people they're just it's, it's a kind of heavy zone so everything below five is just very very light everyone kind of get that and then anything between nine and ten is very very subjective on the day so we're left with different brackets of incredibly subjective uh, no matter how many years of experience you have no matter how often you've trained this particular lift no matter how much experience you have if you were to just to periodize with rp without actually moving through heavy weights and getting to heavy weights and push yourselves you're essentially going to stunt your progress from what we have seen you know people don't push themselves into that realms appropriately too often they'll feel like they'll get to a certain weight how often has someone gotten to um you know you've gotten to like 80 percent you're like there's no way i could go more you put on 20 more kilos and it feels a lot lighter you know it's, it's it is that subjective and i think it's fair to say rpg is so, rpe is such a subjective measurement of performance that when we use personal experiences we can use this as a rebuttal to rp itself you know because everyone has experienced this at how subjective rp is right so if you a program comes in that day and you say get to rp7 uh let's say i'm loading up 180 and it feels like an rp9 i step back to 160 but so often and this happens routinely after nearly 11 years of, of strength training more where i've touched 180 it's felt incredibly heavy I'm like, there's no way I'll be able to do my five sets of three at 220, right? And yeah. then I load 220 and I fit it, no problem. And I, and I, I don't think, you know, we're as science-based as anybody in, in the industry. Yeah. Like, we, we fucking pay-per-views every Monday. But RP is so subjective, you can rebuttal it with subjective experiences. And the subjective experiences then are are incredibly relevant because that happens so often to people. A lot of, a lot of times you'll see, someone will say it, you know they'll be like that looks so easy and yeah, they'll be and like it felt like shit yeah you'll, you'll do a set of five and they'll be like that moves so easy you could definitely done 10 kilos more and subjectively that person might have felt that there is no possible way that we could add it one more kilo or one more rep yeah i think uh talking about this example in particular right top end squats or top sets on squats where you've you're going to hit a certain amount for a triple or a certain amount for a set of five or a set of ten and that's your kind of training for the day uh in in the most basic scientific terms here 
post activation potentiation would dictate that as you progress through the session you're going to get some additional neural uh drive as you go on so like if i'm i'm not even sure how rp looks on programs right but the ones i've seen would be like build up to a set of eight rpe seven um and if i'm building up and i feel like geez like the example you gave 180 feels shit and i'm thinking 220 in my head it happens a lot where you start warming up and beyond your warm-up so you're fully warmed up you've achieved everything you need to with your warm-up and you're now attacking way to your uh completing sets uh, as you're building up towards the working weight a lot of the weights are numerous sets within a certain session depending on the intensity level you're going to can feel heavier than the ones you're about to do so when you look at most pap studies like post activation potentiation you could be talking anywhere between three and 12 minutes where post activation potentiation occurs so it's very very likely that the rpe you're feeling as you build up to a top set is in no way relevant to how you feel when you get to the top set so in in relation to jeff brings up a blood flow restriction uh, study there and he's saying basically that rpe people will train hard and will push you to the limits but basically what we see when people do rp is we end up in this region of what we kind of term junk volume so you're essentially floundering in an area where you're never really pushing yourself into new limits with volume or new limits with intensity so for example in that study those people with the blood flow restriction push to failure but in no strength training program for example would you ever actually push something to failure you would never ever ever go to failure absolutely there was never a cause for that so what we see in practicality with people in strength training when they use rp so Jeff mentions earlier in the video that he sees a lot of top IPF lifters use it, right? But I honestly think there is a positive user bias and an experienced user bias here. So these coaches, right? So these athletes are very experienced. For example, the top of the IPF, they're very strong people. They've been trained for a long time. They have a lot of knowledge. Someone like Jeff, for example, has been around for years. He's taught about his training. He's dedicated a lot of his life to it, of course. You then have a, a bias towards the use of RPE in terms of the progress that people get. So when you're coaching people, you will know the basics of strength training and the basics of progression never change. You know that you need to move through. It's not rocket science, you know, it's fairly simple. Essentially, it's a, it's an interesting X in terms of volume and intensity. So volume goes down as intensity goes up. And this works for the vast majority of people in terms of absolute strength who are not training 20 times a week. So if we have people who are training four or five times a week, when they're doing this kind of training, you know you need to be moving through certain bands of coaching, right? So... Jeff may be using this, for example, not picking on Jeff in particular, or these IPF lifters might be using this in terms of training and they'll be doing their sets of 10 or whatever. And then next week they'll be doing their sets of six. And then they'll know subconsciously either that the lifter they're coaching will need to go to like, say, they started with three by 10 and 100 kilos. They know that the eights will need to end up somewhere around 120. So they'll know that then at least either they'll push them or if it's a self-application of the program, they'll know they need to get somewhere around 120 and then I would imagine, lo and behold, that that RPE feels appropriate to the weight that you end up using. So that RPE that you thought it would be is the same as the weight you would use. Yeah, absolutely. And I think as well, it happens in every single sporting context uh, where people just say, like, any amount of any amount of motivation or shouting at someone mm -hmm. is technically altering RPE, you know? And there's a lot of studies on that too for yeah. science, you know? So, like, if you're, if you're training in a powerlifting club, and everyone's using RPE. And last week, Gurf came in and he did three sets of 10 to 200. And this week, he's going from, from three sets of 10 to 200. And he's supposed to do five sets of eight at 210. If Gurf comes in and Gurf is acting like an asshole because he's tired. And his 180s look shit. His 200s look shit. As if, as a coach, I'm going to say, uh, Owen, uh, maybe get your head out of your fucking ass. And do your sets at 210. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. I feel really tired. I think it's completely out of the realms of possibility that as a professional coach, you're not then going to be like, stop. This is ludicrous. Mm -hmm. Stop telling me how you feel. Yeah. Like, how you feel does not matter that much. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't think of a single athlete-coach relationship that's effective that would use something like that. Do you know, like, where, it's, yeah. where that would actually be listened to? Yeah. Yeah, too often, you know, again, you prefer... If, RPE is a subjective form of measurement in reality. Someone has put into practicality. So you might say that, oh, it's easy. Well, uh, 10 is a very hard rep. It's the most you could do. You know, yeah. uh, people are incredibly subjective, you know, and we're very open to suggestions from other people. Uh, so th th there is papers on this, for example, maybe we might do one next week or week after where they talk about 
they go through um you know they'll even mention some of these like blood flow restriction papers where they'll they'll state the term um testers used positive verbal language yeah, or whatever yeah. consistently across all of them and then in the studies that it's trying to look for does this give you more reps it always gives you more reps you know so that the subjectivity changes but what we're trying to get at is this the absolute percentage of your one rm which matters your max ability does not change unless you progress and that is what we're trying to get across here is that yeah. these don't change and you need to hit these no matter what way you put on it no matter what number you put on it or what kind of effort you want to put on it you've if you want to progress and you want to hit these new numbers you've got to hit these new numbers in the new bands in your 80s and 90 percent you've got to hit them uh no amount of well i feel like i'm hitting 80 percent and it feels hard so this is rp9 so i'm definitely going to progress in reality like you've Heavier weights have their own particular types of coordination and you've got to be hitting those and getting close to those to practice new coordination for your new 1RM if that's what you want, a new 1RM. So like the very last thing I want to say on this before we move on to the last few points is when as coaches or as athletes we're looking at programming and we're looking at manipulating aspects or variables within that program, we want to manipulate things that are very, very consistent. So in the same way whereby if I have an athlete who trains 50% of their sessions in a university or a, quad or a squad gym and they spend 50% of their time at home, I wouldn't prescribe weights if I knew their weights at home were in kilos, but all the ones in the gym were off or they were in pounds, you know. It, it would make absolutely no sense for me to use that. So if I know I'm going to use weight as an absolute or as a variable, because weight is consistent and I know I'm going to use reps or sets as a, a variable because I hope that my athlete can count um, or at least count as far as 10. Uh, so those things don't change. But then we know RP can be very, very not fickle, but it can be altered in certain environments. So if we have environments where we have things like Garf talked about earlier, positive verbal encouragement in a lab setting. Music music we might have better environmental conditions so something as simple as how warm yeah. how humid how well lit the room is we might have other things that throughout the course of a day somebody might feel better for training or somebody might feel worse for training we've heard gabriel sincrain talking multiple times about circadian rhythm rhythm and throughout the day 3 p.m was the worst time he could possibly train yeah. so when we're looking at that as coaches and trying to get as much from the scientific journals and literature as we possibly can, we'd never pick a variable to manipulate through the training cycle that can be altered so drastically. In the same way, we wouldn't use weight plates that change their weight from day to day. So, on to Jeff's kind of last point there where he talks about, so the argument, the counter argument is that it doesn't provide too much information or essentially RP is a form of over information for additional stuff of training, additional variables for no reason. So we're obviously, we just want to make the point that we're not anti any kind of training. Yeah, we definitely don't say that. No. And like, we're all for any, if you want to record any variable you want or do whatever you want, then we're all for it. So if you want to record more variables, the better, then that's no problem. We don't think over information is a huge issue. So what we do think is a better measurement or a better variable to measure is bar speed and velocity. And so this is backed up very well by the science, for example, at the moment. So rather than using RP, which is very subjective, we would use a measurement of bar velocity. So in terms of strength training. So we does a lot of the, the science every year. More papers are produced using bar speed velocity as a measurement of, you know, as a variable to measure during strength training. And in conjunction, does it does this particular bar speed measure with particular percentages? So does one meters per second, does that put you at somewhere between 80% and does like 0.8 meters per second put you above 90%? And I think they're kind of narrowing down the ranges and what's more of a general recommendation for people. But if you are the kind of person who wants to record variables about the training you enjoy the process or you think it's useful if you're using bar velocity uh, you don't have to use it for example as a as a preemptive form of progression so you don't go next week i'm going to use uh, 0.8 meters per second and then i'm going to get to 0.75 because that means i'm increasing the weight rather if you just want to use it as a measure of a variable so then when you look back over six months of your training so you've recorded six months uh, four times a week of your training of your bar velocity when you are doing your squat bench and deadlift or whatever it is you can look back look at the average bar speeds you were hitting and then looking at how your progress went and then maybe you can use that as a form of uh, as a variable to measure in future and possibly include it somewhere because it's very very objective it's, there's no subjectivity in terms of your bar speed so 
you can put in more effort, but that doesn't mean the, the weight is going to move any faster, you know? No matter how fast you want to move 90%, if it's not happening that day, if you're not strong enough, you're not able to put in enough force at a particular velocity, then it's not going to move faster. So the RPE might change if you try harder, but the velocity of the bar will definitely not change. So you can use this as an effective variable to measure. It's very consistent. It's very, very objective. There's no leeway here. If you use the same tool to measure your bar velocity, then you are in a much more grounded a much more solid realm of scientific principles to measure for your training if that is something you wish to do now, you don't have to do that and hundreds of thousands of people have gotten very strong not using any of these principles but if you're the kind of person who does enjoy that bar velocity would be a much better way to go yeah, yeah and then i definitely think for standard applications bar velocity is probably the best if you look at like gold standard measures um you're probably looking at like maximum isometric pulls like isometric pull was something that was originally kind of brought about um as a measurement of fatigue or as neural fatigue by uh the german sports scientists in like the 50s so midway throughout the morning before they would train they'd stand on a steel plate that had a t-handle attached in the middle you just have a simple spring balance they'd pull as hard as possible from the mid thigh you get a measurement for that isometric pull and then if that measurement is where it should be, you go and train and the weights are, are what the weight should be or the, the speed of running or the volume of running and jumping is where it should be. And then if that weight is down, you might need to take a break. Or if that weight is, is higher, you know you haven't trained hard enough the day before. So if you move that to, to modern day technology, like accelerometers on the bar is absolutely perfect. So to get a velocity measurement for your barbell, it's probably the most applicable to normal athletes now. If you're in a sports science setting, you could use a force plate and you could use a bar that's pinned to the ground. Uh, so there's multiple ways of getting really, really good data. Like we are 100% for collecting more data, finding out more about yourself, tabulating that data, tracking everything. Um, we just don't believe collecting wishy-washy data is the best way to go. You know, even... As a, as a funny kind of coincidence or not coincidence, consequence of the paper reviews we've done in the last few weeks and over the last few months is that we've started to put more of an eye on bar speed velocity. So bar velocity, fucking hell, why do I keep saying that? So bar velocity. So early in the year, we people have asked sort of a form, we've, we've been kind of like, maybe. But the more we see of it, the more it looks like a useful principle for, for that right kind of athlete, for that person who is a little bit more advanced and who... Who needs a little bit more nuance in the training it is something we're we're thinking about and that we're not going all of a sudden trying into training but we are looking at it it is in the back of our minds kind of so we're we're, we're open to principles but 100 percent um we just don't think rp is for what it feels like rp is a poor man's um velocity measure or another more objective measurement of that it's yeah. what you had pre-velocity it feels like a step before that because I, they're probably in sim similar you know kind of they probably overlap reasonably well if you're on a good form that day. So your bar speed would match well if you are feeling like an RP8 and you're going for like 0.8 meters per second or something, you know, whatever like that. Is. Yeah. They probably overlap well, but the consistency of the bar velocity, for example, would be a lot better. So the last thing we just kind of want to add about RP, right, is we're also, as much as we like science, as much as we're scientifically trained or whatever, science, as many useful, useless, useful, useless degrees we have, <laughs> We are big on success leaves clues, you know, and that's one of the reasons, for example, uh, for anyone who's, who've known us for a long time or have been following us for a while, you know, we would have gone to, uh, like, you know, Germany, Romania, um, fucking Qatar, Qatar, you know, we've talked about Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, a lot of very strong people who know a lot of strong stuff because we're, we're big on the success leaves clues and we've learned a whole lot from them. And one thing we haven't seen, and now I know this is just anecdotal evidence, so if you're going to pick on any of our points, don't really pick on this one because it's anecdotal it's it's subjective the last thing we want in the comment section is you putting in some ipf powerlifter who's done all these weights and always uses rp yeah we don't care but <laughs> what um what we haven't seen is that we have not seen for example good weightlifters use this so if we're just talking about weightlifters in terms of strength training and they do have some very very strong numbers and if you want to look at it that way it's very often he could have bit the ipf world record you know like yeah okay whatever um, it's likely he's on more drugs than that person is or whatever but that's not a good argument but they're very strong you know and what we haven't seen is people using something like RP or an equivalent of RP in terms of, of strength training so they don't go someone doesn't go well I need to hit an RP 9 squat to clean and jerk 200 kilos they go I need to squat 300 kilos to hit a 200 kilo clean and jerk every week and it's very very specific 
they use specific weights or pacific weights if you're a podcast listener <sighs> they are very 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 clear about what numbers they need to hit and they're very in tune about what needs to be done and what numbers they need to be consistently hitting so for example we'll take uh gabriel Sincrean. so he talked about front squatting before the olympics um this sounds like like a um an ad hominem argument or whatever or, or the reverse of that whatever that's called but it is a good example so gabriel talked about he needed to double 250 kilos in the front squat twice a week to clean and jerk um 220 kilos or less at the olympics gabriel didn't say something i need to front squat an rp8 multiple times a week there was no he, he, you think his coaches would have had any leeway or give a I shit if you feel said, like i'm exerting myself amply yeah it was 250 for multiple doubles a couple of times a week that's just one of many many examples yeah. Where lifters will talk about, like we've seen, you know, Tashiki talk about he needs to squat 320 before he can compete with Tian Tao. Or, and I know these evidence are, are people based on only weightlifters because that's what we're heavily involved in. But elite athletes are elite athletes and successful people are successful people. And it's a very consistent variable among them is that they don't, they're not subjective with their training. They do some auto regulation, but they're very specific about weights they need to hit. Absolutely. Yeah. And we do, like, we know one powerlifter in particular who's been to IPF Senior Worlds and came top 10 at that mm-hmm. who uses rp in his training but he's also the most scientific man you'll ever come across in your life and is incredibly diligent uh with his training in terms of sets reps loading you know it he literally goes from four sets with the same weight the same everything is exactly the same just the five sets a week after and his accessories you know like you're talking about somebody who's deeply analytical and they use rp um, and that's what I'd say. Like ju- we haven't come across many athletes who use it successfully. We don't use it. Um, the a, a post hoc applying of RP or post uh, post happening of the event isn't. Oh yeah, it was an RP April. Yeah. So you know oh. when you see your favorite ALPF lifter on Instagram go, uh, yeah, but RP eight today. You don't know that he said he was going into hit RP eight. <laughs> he wasn't looking for RP eight. He was looking for a three hundred twenty kilo back squat. Yeah absolutely and the last like what i'm going to finish on now uh is a very very simple example so we've talked about absolute strength here and the importance of like the skill of the movement your volume you're accruing over a period of time the intensities you get on a regular basis being very very important but the last thing i'll finish on is the skill of the movement itself And if you have a squat that's 90% and you're doing it for a double and you have effective use of stretch shortening cycle, you have effective use of proper bracing and breathing techniques, that squat double at 90% can feel like a super easy, you're absolutely fucking nailing the squat. If everything is good, your descent pace is correct, you properly rebound out of the bottom, you've braced before you stand up that can feel like the easiest double you'll ever do. Like those 90% doubles are fucking sweet most of the time. But if you fuck it up, you can, your RP of that squat can be one of the worst squats you'll ever do in your life. Like you don't brace before you sit down. You might sit down too slowly. You don't get a rebound out of the bottom or you get too much of a rebound out of the bottom. And that's how big the difference can be on an identical movement with the identical loading on the same day. So thanks for watching. If you could leave a like and a comment, we'd really appreciate it. Um, like helps an awful lot and so do comments, uh, especially initially. So if like you're watching this and you have a comment, just leave it. So like in the initial few minutes of the video, because, you know, it helps with YouTube and stuff. So we do really appreciate that to any of our, our, our uh, long term listeners, any new people. Um, thanks for clicking on. Thanks for clicking on. Yeah. To our usual people. Um, we love you.